Hey, this is the this is the second last session of Dream Week 2019. Okay. A um, uh, question: How many of you are here on Sunday? Why? Because we are hungry. Okay, you have an option. There's not a lot that you get options in this church. I just want to tell you. <laughs> How many of you want to come to two services Sunday morning? And the rest of you that you get cold so quickly. Because if you're going to come to two services, we'll have two different speakers for you. If not, if not, I can give you one speaker. So let's vote. Oh, no, no. Oh. Vice, let us see. Let us see. Let us see. <laughs> okay, you're all doing this. Peace. Okay. Amen. Well, what an absolutely amazing week that is, this has been. We want to welcome Daystar with us at this session again, Pastor Marcus and Joni Lamb. We welcome you with us. Thank you for taking this conference across the world. We honor you. We treasure you. And we love you. And we trust that the viewers will be mightily touched by what God is doing in South Africa and Africa in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Daystar viewers a big, God bless you and a big welcome. Thank God for technology. Amen. Um, tonight is a, going to be a great evening. It is already a great evening. The atmosphere is absolutely electric and you are not even tired. That's amazing. Because normally on a Friday night people come like, I come alive. It's like, no, you people are ready just to, to take off. So that is absolutely amazing. And you make it great and easy for the speakers to speak. You are a church in revival. And we are trusting that this fire and this revival will go to London. Come on, the Londonites, the Europeans, Polish, Africanites, Amalekites, Jebusites, Freestites, Chautites. <laughs> Let me stop there. Just now I say something wrong. Amen. Ach, smile toch no man. As I believe. You know me. I'm going to talk until you smile. You know me. You can't look at me so sedig. Because this is not only a Sunday morning. You can't look at me in your church. Tonight, one of the people that greatly impacted my life. Um, you know, I said this the first night of the conference, that God in your formative years brings the right people. And sometimes it's one word somebody speaks and it's also a message or something somebody represents. We have Dream Week and we have chosen this time very specific in the holiday time when people go away on holiday, our families, because I realize that your late teens and your 20s are your most important years in decision making and if we can give you the right examples and the right paradigm then anything is possible come on how many of you believe anything is possible if you can believe so pastor casey treat came to south africa i think the first time was about 1985 88 and i sat in rayma and i saw this red head on fire Man of God just preaching the gospel and talking about the renewing of your mind. If you can change your mind, you can change your life. Because we all grew up thinking a certain way, confined thoughts. And I grew up in a church, well, when I got saved, everybody said one day. And the church always stayed small. 11 years, we never broke 200 in that church. And I mean, we fasted and we prayed half night, not half night prayers. I'm easy on you, but in those years, it was like 6 o'clock. Friday night till 6 o'clock Saturday morning. It was on my car. I mean, you start praying and you don't take a pause. You don't even listen to God to talk to you. You just go like... But nobody was prospering. Nobody was going anywhere. And then I was exposed to this message, if you can change your mind and... 
the power of the renewal of the mind, which is totally scriptural. It's not new age thinking. It's absolutely in the Bible. And I honor God for this gift that is still the same, that is changing our world and revolutionizing the way people think. Let's put our hands together tonight and welcome all the way from Seattle, the United States of America, Pastor Casey Treat, one of the most on fire radical preachers you are going to meet. Come on, CRC. This is the revival. We're not praying for the revival. We're living in the revival. Come on, somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I give somebody a high five. Great to be at Dream Week. Great to be a part of CRC, touching South Africa, touching our world for Jesus. Happy to be here. Happy my daughter Tasha is with me. Moses says hello. Those of you that know Mos, South Africa is my home away from home. I feel like I'm part of the family. I will soon have a South African grandchild. I'm not announcing anything. I'm just saying, <laughs> relax. What a wonderful week. Had fun over in Bloom and excited to be here in Pretoria and uh, ready for the weekend. We'll hang around for Sunday. See who's spiritual, who shows up on Sunday. The real saints. Want to say welcome to Daystar. Thank you, Marcus and Joni, for hosting CRC and Dream Week on Daystar all over the world through that wonderful network. And uh, it's amazing the lives that you touch and the people that are lifted and healed and helped because of that broadcast, and uh, it goes places we will never know. So we are happy to be a part of it this week. We're happy to be involved with Daystar Ministries, and we honor you, Marcus and Joni, and uh, all of your hard work. Let's give them a good hand clap. CRC. Thank you, Daystar. So when I was first saved, right, a few years ago, okay, 45 years ago. I know I still look young, right? Yeah, thanks for the support. I always doubted myself. I questioned myself. My thoughts were so focused on my insecurities, what I didn't have, what I couldn't do. Going through school, I never was the cool kid. I never was the great athlete, which is maybe why I ended up just being a drug addict, trying to medicate the pain of my reality, trying to avoid my reality, that inferiority, that insecurity, that feeling like I wish I was smarter. I, I wish I was stronger. I wish I was better. I wish I was like so-and-so or somebody else, but never feeling that. When I came to Christ, I began to read the Scripture, began to realize I do have what it takes. It's not about having a high IQ. It's not about having a certain look. It's not about having the right style. It's not about being the best athlete or the greatest student. It takes other things that anybody, everybody, even I, have. Maybe you've had that thought. If I was like so-and-so, I know it works for pastor, but I just can't see how it would work for me. I, I know the promises of God are happening for others, but I just can't see how They'll happen for me. And that inferiority, that insecurity 
hold so many people back, stop so many people from moving into what God has for them. There's a movie a few years ago about astronauts, and uh, the title was The Right Stuff. And it had to do with their training and preparation for a mission into outer space. And, uh, boy, they had to really be able to handle all of the challenges, mental challenges, physical challenges. They really had to have the right stuff. I felt the Holy Spirit say to me as I was meditating on that idea the other day, you have the right stuff. You have what it takes. Believe that you have what it takes. Believe that you're not missing something. Believe that God's already put in you what you need to see abundant life, to live in his perfect will, to experience his prosperity, to have his healing and his blessing in every realm. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap if you can agree with that. What if, what if you could believe you have the right stuff? It doesn't come when you graduate from college, although I hope you go to college and I think you should develop your education as far as you can, but that's not going to make you a success because there's a lot of smart people who can't keep their marriage together. There's a lot of educated people who can't make any money. There's a lot of people with high IQs but low level of life. So stop saying, if I was only smarter, if I could just get a degree, or when I get through with college, then I'm going to really... I started ministry in my first year of college. I was on television once a week. I was on radio every day, and I would get phone calls, and people would be mad at me. Oh, you think you're some rich preacher? You think you're some big-time preacher? And I was a Bible school student living in a one-bedroom apartment. So you don't have to wait for something. When I get married, when I have children, if I was older, you know what happens real quick? You'll start saying, if only I was younger. It's amazing how fast it switches. One day you were saying, if I was just older, maybe they would respect me. And before you know it, you're saying, man, I wish I was younger. You better decide right now, I have what it takes. Right now, I've got the right stuff. Right now, I can live an abundant life. I don't need anything else except what God's put in me. Me and Jesus can make this thing happen. Now, whatever that calling is, whatever that mission is, your marriage, your family, your business, one thing I know, God did not design you to survive. He designed you to live. Nowhere in the Bible does it say it's going to take all your faith and all that you've got within you just to get by in life. That's not in the Bible. The Bible says he came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Four times the Bible said we live by faith. Stop using your faith to just survive. If you're going to use your faith, might as well use it to live this abundant life. Stop praying for this month's rent. Begin to believe for your destiny, God's prosperity, his purpose, his mission in your life. You're thinking so small because you don't think you got the right stuff. Maybe you're following your parents' model or the community model that you grew up. Whatever it is, it really doesn't matter. Let's begin to believe. I have what it takes to live big. I have what it takes to make a difference. 
Have what it takes to be a part of my church and influence people. Have what it takes to bring people to Christ. I have what it takes to give and change my world. I'm not using all my faith to barely get by. I'm using my faith to change my world. Let's not wait for something more. Let's believe we have the right stuff. Let me read this scripture to you. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'll start at verse 2. 2 Timothy 2 and 2. The things you've heard from me among many witnesses. I'm reading the New King James Bible. Commit to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also. It's always about others, right? Get bigger than yourself. Get beyond yourself. Don't live to get a blessing. Live to be a blessing. Verse 3. You, therefore, endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And if anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And finally, the hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. You have what it takes to be a soldier. You have what it takes to be an athlete. And you have what it takes to be a farmer. None of those require a certain level of education or physical strength. They require a certain attitude, a certain mentality. I'll tell you a funny story about my family. I have three kids. The oldest one, Caleb, he's married, has three children. The second one, Tasha, married Moses here in South Africa. And the third one, Micah, he, he was always a reader. But he was the kind of kid that would flunk reading because he was busy reading. <laughs> he never wanted to read what the teacher assigned. He was always tripping on something else. And so he was in his own world and didn't really turn out for sports much. And, you know, just a good kid, went to church. One day he comes to me, he's early 20s, and he says, I'm going in the Army, Dad. I said, what? Going in the Army? Yeah, going in the Army. Why? This feels God's plan for my life. My first thought was, This kid's not a soldier. He's going to get shot. He's going to shoot himself. But I've had the thought that God will lead my family and God will lead my children. I'm always going to believe in them. Next thing I know, he's enlisted. He's going through basic. He's hired by the army in intelligence, becomes an intelligence officer. He's in Korea. He's working over there, analyzing the North Koreans. He's flying drones. He's probably flown over your house. (laughs) No, I don't know that. Now he's a sergeant in the army. He's on his way to officer's training. He never was the strong kid. He never was the fighter. He's a soldier. And in the army of the Lord, you have what it takes. Stop telling yourself, if only. Stop comparing yourself and saying, well, I'm not, not, I'm not like them. They're successful. They're prosperous. They're doing great things, but I'm not like them. No, the Bible says to you, to every believer, to every one of us, be a soldier in this army of the Lord. And soldiers require toughness, strength, endurance. You got that. You put up with your husband all these years. You. 
You've had children. You are a soldier. You live in South Africa. You're a soldier. You're a Christian in an ungodly world. You're a soldier. So Paul writes to this young man, Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier. Don't get caught up in the affairs of this life. Don't live for someone else's praise. Don't don't compete for someone else's uh, adoration. Don't, Don't compare yourself and be a part of the way the world operates. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. And so we soldier on and fight the good fight, no matter what comes against us. This year, Wendy and I are celebrating 40 years in ministry. I know. I started church when I was 14. No, not really. I was smoking pot when I was 14. I don't even remember being 14. There's a lot of blank space back there. No, we started church. I was 24 years old, and and, and this year we're celebrating 40 years. Wendy and I have been married for 42 years. To stay married for 42 years, you got to be a soldier. Right? And you have to decide, we're not going to fight with each other. We're going to fight for each other. But if you don't fight, you'll lose your marriage. If you don't fight, you'll lose your children. If you don't fight, you will never have the right stuff to walk in God's abundant life. Some of us have the idea that if we just have enough faith, there'll there'll not be any battles. Somehow the devil lied to you. And you accepted the idea that when problems come, something's wrong. The Bible says you're a soldier. When battles come, soldiers rise up. When battles come, soldiers get excited. Soldiers live for the battle. How many Christian people avoid the battle? And in so doing, they avoid their destiny. They never experience God's will. They never get into their mission. They never get into their destiny. They never experience all that God has for them because they avoid the fight. You can't get away from the fight if you're going to walk with God. I don't mean a natural fight. I'm not talking about physical fights. I'm talking about that fight of faith. That fight to endure, that fight to keep your head up, that fight to believe when it looks like nothing's working, that fight to speak God's word and nothing else. You got to fight to live that way. Somebody said, oh, those Christians, they just believe in prosperity and healing. All right. How easy is that? Seems to me it's a lot easier just to stay sick and poor. You don't got to do nothing. Watch TV, eat potato chips, drink Coca-Cola. Pretty soon you're 100 pounds overweight and no job. Your wife left, your dog left, somebody stole your pickup truck. (laughs) Easy. If you want to walk in favor and walk in blessing and walk in destiny and live this abundant life, you got to be a good soldier. You got to fight the good fight of faith. And when the fight comes, it's not unusual. It's it's nothing bad. It's not that you've done something wrong or you, you haven't had enough faith. That's called Christian life. And so let's be ready for the fight. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were called and have confessed a good confession in the presence of many. Fight that fight of faith. It's easier to doubt. 
It's easier to give up. It's easier to just feel like, oh, I can't do it. I'm too tired. I don't have what it takes. It's easier to cop out. Do you say that in South Africa? The cop out. I can't make it to church. I went two times last week. I'm going to miss Sunday. How crazy is that? I read two scriptures today. I can't read any more. Stop copping out. Stop opting out. Stop looking for a way to give up and be a soldier that endures and fights till you win. What else you got to do? Suffer, struggle, be sick, sad, and sorry? Might as well fight. You're going to do something for the next few years. You just want to have a sad marriage and a sad family and a low income and no influence? Might as well fight for something great. If we're going to fight, let's fight for something great. Fight the good fight of faith. Second Timothy chapter 4, Paul said, I fought the good fight. Paul was a fighter. They'd stone him to death. He'd just get up and make them all mad. Fight to live. Fight to overcome cancer. Fight to overcome disease. Fight to overcome the challenges of life. It's a battle. But Paul said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. And now there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me. On that day, and not only to me, but all who love his appearing. In 2 Corinthians 10, the apostle writes, Though we walk in the flesh, we don't war in the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We don't fight about this stuff the world fights over. We don't fight about politics. We've got a higher battle to fight. We don't fight about races. we got a higher battle to fight. We don't fight about the stuff that gets the headlines and the world gets stirred up about. And if you've been fighting about that stuff, you need to raise your vision and begin to fight the good fight. Fight the fight with God. Fight the fight that's in the spirit realm where you can really begin to live that abundant life that he has. Stop wasting your energy arguing with your neighbor about politics. How about this? Fight for their soul to get saved and be right here with you in CRC, worshiping God. That's a little bit better than arguing with them about something in this world. Let's not fight in this natural realm. We just love in the natural realm. We just love people. We just love everybody. Love you, bro. But in our faith, and in our prayer, and in our vision, and in our mission, we fight for what God has for us. And we'll not die before we experience his will, his plan, his purpose. Come on, I want you to see it. You will not die until you see the blessing of the Lord on your life. Fight! Number two, we not only must be soldiers in the army of the Lord, we need the discipline of the athlete. Paul said, when you run, run to win. The athlete has to follow the course. They have to know what they're there for, and they compete for the prize. Sometimes people say, well, is it wrong to believe that God wants to bless our lives, prosper our lives? No. The apostle said, if you're going to run, run to win. Run for the prize. 
What's the prize? The prize is a blessed marriage. The prize is happy children. The prize is a life group, a small group with people getting saved. The prize is prosperity where we can give and help those around us. The prize is a life that's rewarding and fulfilling. Stop running the rat race and start running God's race. Do you say that here in South Africa? The rat race. In America, we use that to define, you know, just going to work and getting through the day and getting through traffic. And I'm just in the rat race. I'm, I'm running, but I'm going nowhere. I'm just barely getting by. I'm surviving. Stop running the rat. You're not a rat. Come on, man. Run to win. Run in God's race. Put your energies into God's will. Put your passions, put your discipline into God's plan for your life. And, and you can know what that is. He's not hiding it. Your career, your family, your calling, he has it for you. Get serious. And you say to God, Lord, I'm getting up early tomorrow. I'm training for my race. I train in prayer. I train in the word. I train by speaking what you speak. I'm training to run my race, and I'm running to win. You get that kind of resolve, and you're going to start seeing victories. You're going to start having some medals hanging around your neck. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says, do you not know? Those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate, disciplined in all things. They do it for a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Verse 27, I discipline my body. The old King James said, I buffet my body. Some of you thought it said, I buffet my body. <laughs> Come on, man. You got to get up on the starting line ready to run. You've been hanging around the buffet table too long. Hey, my, my friends here tonight who, who struggle with addictions... I'm with you, right? Get it? I'm with you. I understand the alcohol addiction, the food addiction, the drug addiction, the smoking addiction, all the addictions. But you can whip those things. You can overcome those things. You're strong. You got the right stuff. You're a soldier and you're an athlete. You ain't got time to let addictions run your life. Stop saying you need a drink to kick the edge off. You're in a race. You're running to win. There's no edge. You're living on the edge. So overcome those addictions. Resolve. Decide. Make the plan. I rise above those things. Hey, you may always have the temptation, but don't succumb to the temptation. You may always have the desire. But don't let that desire run your life. Let your desire for the crown of the Lord, the victory in the Lord, the life, abundant life that he's planned for you. Make that your addiction. You're an athlete. You don't have time for that other stuff. Stop going on those websites. It's not helping you run to win. It's not making your marriage better. It's not making your career better. It certainly isn't making you better. Come on, man, let's run and let's win. Hebrews 12, the Lord says, Seeing we are encompassed by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight 
and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before you. Come on, man. You got to get in this race. Some of you think so small and think so slow. Well, I need to pray about it for about 10 years, and I'll see what's the Lord's will. I had a friend years ago, was a brand new Christian. My friend said, if I feel something's from the Lord, I just do it before the devil tells me I can't do it. You know what? Sometimes... Sometimes you're going to make a mistake. You're going to make an investment that doesn't work. You're going to try a career maybe isn't your thing. You're going to get going some, and it may not be your deal. But you know, if you're in this race with God, you can start over five times while the guy next to you is still thinking about it. I think the Lord would rather see you going full speed with all that is within you than sitting around praying about it. By the way, you're not praying about it. You just say that to sound spiritual. Because <laughs> if you were really praying, you'd get in the race, man. How many people? How many people, 50 years old, still not sure about God's will? 60 years old, still not sure they're in God's plan for their life. Come on, let's run to win. Let's get it settled. Let's, let's know God's will. You can know it if you resolve to know it. You can get on that course and run your course to victory if you decide. As you go, the Lord will steer you if he needs to. He's not nervous. He's like, go, man, go. He's excited to give you that crown. A victory. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap right there. Number three, you need the faithfulness of a farmer. You need the work ethic of a farmer. You know, when I was studying this, I thought about South Africans. I think the South African farmers are world-renowned. Strong, hard, tough, hardworking, nothing given to them. They dug it out of the ground. I think you know what that is as a South African, but even more so as a Christian. The farmer doesn't take a day off. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a vacation, although I'm not very good at vacations. I have to be nice when I'm with the family on vacation. Like, why are we here? What's the goal? <laughs> that's, that's not a good thing to say to your family on vacation. But the farmer's just up every day. My, my grandfather was a farmer in, in the United States, and they had cows to milk, and chickens that laid eggs, and I would visit him for a few months in the summer when I wasn't going to school, and he never said, let's just sleep in today. No, no, we were up early. Sun come up, farmers up, milking cows. Ain't nobody else going to milk the cows. Well, I'm going to call in sick. You better just call in healed. Farmers don't get sick. Ain't got time to be sick. Believe your heal. You, you, okay, now here I go. Some of you like your sickness way too much. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you like it. It's your excuse. Well, I would lose weight, but you know my sickness. Well, well I would apply for that new job, but you know... My migraines. Listen, I'm not making fun of people with pain and people with sicknesses. It's real. My family has fought it. My friends have fought it. I've had to fight it. I've been through the hepatitis C, 11 months on chemotherapy. But all those months of chemotherapy, I never missed church one time. 
I never stop doing what God called me to do. The devil is a liar. Come on, you got a farm to reap. You got blessings and abundant life to reap. You ain't got time to take a day off because you're living this life with God. You got to be a farmer. I got a couple of minutes here. Sit down, listen fast. Farmers would be out there picking those eggs up from the chickens. My brother and I would start messing around. We'd start throwing eggs at each other. My grandma would say, there's your breakfast. <laughs> you just threw your egg breakfast at your brother. Farmers don't play. Farmers have a work ethic. They say that in our current generation, that idea of working hard is not real favorable. I think it's always been something that certain people go for it and other people just be lazy. Let's make sure you are ones that go for it. You're in early. You stay in late. You may not feel like it, but you show up. 40 years later, you're still on course. You're still loving your wife. You're still loving your kids. You're still loving the Lord because the farmer never stops. And by the way, did you know the Bible said love never stops? There's no quitters in the kingdom. There's no quitters in the kingdom of God. We're too busy doing what God called us to do. Galatians 6, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's what he'll reap. Come on, church. Let's sow. Let's reap. Let's experience all that God has for us. Let's get up every day excited about seed I'm going to sow today and harvest that I have coming in my life. And we don't have time to get old. I don't know what you consider old, but let it go. Let's keep reaping. Let's keep sowing. Let's keep living this abundant life. And when we have fought that last battle, and when we have run that last race, and when we have sown that last seed, God will say, come on up. You have won the battle. You have won the race. You have reaped your harvest. You're going to face God soon. Somebody said, is Jesus coming back soon? Well, for us, yes. We're going to face him soon. In our lifetime, by the end of your life, you'll be standing before the Lord. That doesn't mean he came back, but you're going to him. Some may be sooner than others. You don't know. You have no guarantees. Crises in our world. We see it all the time. When you stand before God, is he going to say, you're a good soldier. We'll put a medal on you. You're a good athlete. You kept the discipline. You are a good farmer. You got up every day. When you stand before God, will you receive that crown of righteousness, that eternal life that he has for you? Maybe you're not sure about that. Maybe you've never really connected with God. You know, you can sit in church, but not really connect with God. You can even be religious, but not really connect with God. The Bible said you must be born again. When you're born of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, when you really connect with God, you get on a new course. You get on a new mission. You start living in a new way. Let's pray tonight. I'm going to ask our pastor to come and 
lead us all in prayer. And let's make sure that you're ready to meet him. Let's be sure that you're ready to receive your crown. Let's make sure you're fighting this good fight. You're running this good race. And you're sowing this good seed in the name of Jesus. Pastor Ott, thank you so much. Well, let's say thank you, we Pastor love you. Casey. Amen. We love you. Amen. Oh, come on, you can clap better than that. You will not find Jesus sitting with the sitters. You will find him running with the runners. 85, you are still climbing a mountain. Amen. So, enigens, elke persoon wat my opa noem, God's got a great plan for your life. God's going to do amazing things in your, in your life, but you have your part to play. And that's what we heard tonight. You can have the most beautiful land, but if you do not work the land, cultivate the land, and do your part, that beautiful land is going to be overgrown with thorns and thistles and atlomgemors. You make up your mind to believe what God has for you. And you accept what you have in Christ because in Him you are complete. And whatever God has predestined you for, you can do all things through Christ to strengthen you. I want to say this. A made-up mind is a powerful mind and that's what we heard. Not outside of the grace of God, but with the grace of God is what Paul said. I labored more abundantly, yet not I, but the grace of God that was given me. We can all sit and talk about tomorrow. We can all talk about what we want to do. Or we can get busy right now. And I suggest we get busy right now. That this generation, you get busy now. Wherever you are, with whatever you have received, you become the standout person in your company, among your peers, you become the Shadrach, the Meshach, the Abednego. You become the one with an excellent spirit that catches the eye of the ruler. And that is how your promotion will come. But if you get up late, you're always untidy, your shoes are always dirty, and you have no self-belief, no matter how much God has a plan for your life, it's not happening. It's not happening. We stand equal before the throne of God and this message is he's done it all now we have to compete not against one another but against opposition resistance thoughts and see and then become come on pastors Go back to Europe with a renewed vision, with a renewed mindset, and believe that anything is possible. And you start, and you disciple the one person, and one will become two, will become four, will become 16, will become 32, and you will see the miracle of multiplication as you are a hard-working father, a farmer. Amen. The Bible says, go to Mir in Lear. A lot of lazy people with entitlement, but that's not you. Hey, 21 minutes. If you need water world, let somebody keep your seat because a lot of people are going to come in. I see there's a lot of empty chairs there. So first come, first serve. No entitlement in this place. Love all of you. God bless you. <laughs>